Hey everybody, Elizabeth Nader here, Jersey First TV, back with you tonight. New Jersey, do you know where your water comes from and what's in it? Such an important show tonight for all of you to watch. Watch it till the end. This is about the Ringwood Mines and Landfill Superfund site in Northern New Jersey, and you will be surprised how it likely affects you. So let me welcome our guest to the show tonight, Chief Vincent Mann, Chief of the Turtle Clan, the Ramapo Lenape Indian Nation, and Judy Sullivan, attorney, professor, civic leader, as well as founder and chair of the Ramapo Conservancy. Both of you, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yes, we are honored to have both of you here. Uh, you have a tremendous amount of information, and we're going to do our best tonight to tell this story that so many people in New Jersey need to pay attention to. And uh, we will walk through all of it. But what I want to say to the audience before we start is that just 39 miles outside of New York City in the beautiful Ramapo Mountains at the top of an incredibly important water source for millions in northern New Jersey, the Wanaku Reservoir sits a highly toxic site that has devastated the indigenous community there and really put millions of New Jerseyans' lives at risk, their health at risk, an important issue that needs to be told. So let's start, Chief, with you. I want you to give us just a quick overview of who the Lenape Nation is in Ringwood, what the mountains mean to your clan, and what you guys have been going through in the past 50 plus years. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you. Um, and it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, so the turtle clan of the Ramapo uh, Lenape Nation is the descendants of the uh, original inhabitants, uh, the Muncie speaking people. Um, our community um, has three clans um, of which one the turtle clan is and I'm the turtle clan chief. Um, so our community um, has always lived in the area of what is now known as the Ringwood Mines Superfund site. Um, Prior to uh, there actually being mines, our, our relatives were the ones who showed, um, you know, Peter Hosenclever, you know, the, the iron ore coming out of the earth, you know. Um, and some of our people um, were okay with being a part of, um, you know, the iron industry and some didn't. Some, you know, created the charcoal to burn in the furnaces. Um, and then over time, our people uh, began to work the mines as well. Um, Peter's mine, which is 2,400 feet deep, uh, has 17 levels, hundreds of miles of tunnels um, under people who have no idea um, that it's even there. Um, and so in the, in the uh, late 60s, uh, the Ford Motor Corporation bought um, 900 acres um, of this land. And their intention was to remove a thousand turtle clan members um, and build a executive housing. And when they uh, lost the, the bid to do that, um, they almost immediately within months began to dump toxic material from the Ford motor plant in Mawa um, on the ground, in the air shaft, in the mines. Um, this being the lands that our people lived off of, hunt, fish, play, swam, um, harvested, you know, gathered wild edibles and wild medicinals. Um, and so in the 1969, uh, the town of Ringwood wrote a letter to Henry Ford, the grandson, and requested all the industrial waste be disposed of there. Uh, Ford was disposing of 16 million pounds a quarter. Um, 1970, the state of New Jersey actually issued a permit uh, to O'Connor disposal. Um, and so even if it was only that one year, right, where the state had issued that permit four times 16 million pounds of paint sludge, that's just one type of paint sludge. There are several, um, and that doesn't include any of the other solvents. Um, and then in the late 70s, we started to have a, a massive die off and sickness of people, which then elevated that to say, hey, what's going on with us? Um, Superfund was created in 1980. Um, and it wasn't even until 1986, right, that this site became listed on the um, on the priorities list, the NPL. 
let me just pause you there for a moment because it's important that people understand what a Superfund site is. We have 114 of them, I believe, in New Jersey. And of course, they're throughout the nation. The Ringwood site that we're talking about tonight has been purported to be one of the worst, the most toxic sites in the entire country. And I just want to show everybody a map of where this is. You can see the New York and New Jersey line there up at the top, and you see where the Ringwood Mines and the landfill sites sit above the Wanaku Reservoir. And that is the area that you're talking about, Chief, where mm -hmm. the Ford dumping happened. Um, so explain to people quickly, and then we're going to go to Judy for a little more history um, okay. about the um, about the actual Superfund word, what that means and why that was set up. So uh, Superfund, which is the uh, nickname for CERCLA, um, it is a site that um, where corporations had either purposely dumped or uh, a site that became contaminated uh, due to chemicals that leached into the ground um, and into groundwater. Um, and so the federal government back then uh, with, uh, I think, Senator Lautenberg uh, was a big supporter of, um, you know, the CERCLA law. And uh, that was created so that uh, wherever these issues resided, that the federal government as well as the state uh, would actually hold these um, uh, people accountable and to do full remediations and cleanup so that the right. communities can live a healthy life. Right. So the Superfund was created in 1980. We know the site was added in 84, I believe. Um, Judy, I want you to add a little bit to what the chief is talking about, just to sort of recap that area. For people that even live near there may not realize all the mines that were there, the iron ore back in the 1700s. And then, of course, you know, we fast forward to the Ford uh, plant being built in Mawa, huge plant, and their need to start dumping all this paint sludge, tons and tons of this along with acid bath and other toxic solvents. So Judy, give us an overview of what's happening from the Ford plant starting to dump all the way through now the 80s and the 90s and where we are today at a high level. Tell us what occurred. So as Chief Mann said, uh, the Ford company had built the Mawa manufacturing plant which at one time was uh, manufacturing about 1,000 cars per day. Yeah. And it is a little bit hard to believe, but they paid contractors, which are confirmed as being connected to less than, um, what, how shall we say, uh, legal relationships uh, went up and from Mawa, drove up the mountain to Ringwood and dumped all of the sludge, the broken windows, car parts, everything that you would think of that would be waste from a daily management of a 1,000 day, 1,000 car per day facility. And they dumped it in the mines, which as Chief Mann said, there's about 12 mines in this 500 acre area. Some of them are twice as high deep as the Empire State Building. In fact, when um, at one time the borough owned the property in 1950s, uh, they tried to market the property as an underground warehouse just to give you a size of the vastness of the area, a 14,000 square foot uh, warehouse underground with 17 floors. Uh -huh. So you can imagine going up there every day and dumping all your paint sludge and your parts and not only just in the mines, but also all around where these people live, you know, in the, wherever there was a vacant spot, they would dump. Um, so in, as chief man said in 1984, it was listed on the federal Superfund um, site. Um, and then it was delisted and said uh, the EPA said it was cleaned up. And I have some notes here. Uh, the whopping amount that Ford paid at that time was 430 $5,600 and the borough paid, borough of Ringwood paid $144,700. Then between 1993 and 2005, they keep finding more stuff, more sludge, more barrels. And everyone is saying to themselves, oh my goodness, how could this be? And through the result, through the efforts of a reporter named Jan Barry Crum, he ran a series, an investigative series in the newspaper and the record. And because of that series, 
the site was relisted on a super fun list, which has never happened before in the history of the super fun. This is a federal law throughout the entire United States. So, and that I still believe, I don't check every day, but I still believe this is the only site in the entire nation that's been listed twice because they didn't do it right the first time. And it still may not have been relisted had this reporter not gone out and do this. So 2005, it gets uh, brought back on the site again. And then something strange happens because we had a proposal from uh, the borough and from Ford to spend about $35 million to uh, clean up the site and do some other things. Uh, but then um, as Chief Man knows, um, at the very 11th hour, um, Ford had proposed to rebuild this, the recycling plant. So on top of all this, you have a recycling plant right in the middle of these um, citizens neighborhood. And they say, well, well, we'll rebuild your recycling plant. So suddenly the cost came down to much, much less, like 21 million, I think it was. And this was announced about a year or two ago. You could read about it in the papers. Um, and they would put this asphalt barrier over one of the sites where there was high contamination. So where we are today is that this is what's happening now. They actually are in week three. Uh, what they plan on doing just for lay people's purposes is they plan on scraping off some dirt on the top of the most contaminated locations, the Peters Mine Pit, the Cannon Mine, and then some of the areas near the, um, the recycling center, cover it up with a permeable cap, meaning sort of like a, like a blanket, if you will, and then just monitor. That's the extent of the cleanup, just monitor. Okay, so so that's, where, that's where we are today. We're talking about cap and monitor, but that's obviously not what needs to happen to truly, uh, truly clean up this site. You know, Chief, I want you to paint a picture for everyone because we're about to show them in a moment how this affects them, but I want you to start with your nation. If you watch the documentary, Man versus Ford, it's done very well in that documentary to paint a picture of how your people interacted with these landfills and this dumping. It was literally part of their life. It was right there in their backyard. Paint that picture to help us understand this wasn't down the street. It was right there. Yeah, it was, um, sorry, I have a little visitor here. Um, it, it was in the community. And what, what was one of the most, one of the sickest things that took place was that uh, the people who were bringing this material there would also take valuable parts, um, whether that was copper or, you know, wheels or tires and things like that, for our community members to actually go into that paint sludge and actually get those things out. Um, it, I can't even really truthfully begin to, to explain um, you know, like even the, to the kids playing on it, the kids eating it because it tasted a certain way. Um, I mean, there, uh, there was one area that was called Sludge Hill. Is that the, uh, the quantity um, of paint sludge that's come there has just been absolutely mind boggling. It's and it wasn't the only place that was dumped. There, right. there was, you know, anywhere in a two mile radius when the docks down in, in New Jersey, the docks were burning. It was because they dumped the paint sludge there, which is yeah. also and, and just to throw in there, you know, that's where all of the fires that raged on for weeks on end um, was the burning of the of the paint sludge and those things um, to, um, you know, to, to burn it down. Well, we know that the fires also created another toxic hazard. But, you know, you paint this picture of the kids sliding down the sludge hill, eating the eating the dirt pies as kids, right? Because it tasted good. You've got people going into these dumps and getting metals out to feed their family and sell. They are interacting with this horrific toxic material every day. And it doesn't take much for us to understand that it gets into the water. So it gets everywhere. So, so Chief, paint the picture of the kind of health issues that the Klan has faced. And I mean, you are coming from a funeral even today. It's heartbreaking. Tell us what kind of health issues they have seen. So our, our community has every imaginable health ailment from uh, cancer to rare cancers, to multiple cancers, to um, skin diseases, diabetes, bronchitis, um, uh, asthma, uh, eye issues, um, death, right? And how in this country, 
again, 39 miles outside of New York City, that anybody in any kind of uh, a municipality, a county level, state level, or federal level can allow an indigenous community or any community to continue to sit there and die and suffer because of what somebody else's actions were. It's insane. And then they take no accountability, none, right? right? They run the other way when people begin to talk about the, the potential, if not actually has in the past, um, toxification of the Wanakee Reservoir, which just sits less than a mile away. Well, let's talk about that uh, because this is where we move beyond um, the incredible pain that your people have faced to now looking at this as the entirety of Northern New Jersey being affected. Before I show the watershed, um, Judy, I'm gonna show here a list of contam contaminants and um, just talk a little bit about what has been found here and how serious they are. Uh, so the groundwater most serious contaminants are arsenic, lead, benzene, and a new contaminant called 1,4-dioxane, which is an emerging contaminant, meaning that it hasn't even been defined yet, more or less, by national organizations like the EPA. We do not have um, clear remediation for uh, an emerging contaminant like that. 1,4-dioxane was discovered in spring of 2015 in the groundwater. Um, there's also been arsenic, antimony, um, and with respect to the, um, the groundwater itself, the 1,4-dioxane, for example, is actually reaching the Wanakee Reservoir, but the way the EPA defines it, if it's below a certain level, even though it's reaching it, if it's below a certain level, it gets the definition of non-detect. So, um, you know, I know the North Jersey Water Commission has actually filed papers in this case that have said, we're very concerned and we would rather have a pump and treat remedy uh, of the groundwater in and around the Ringwood Mines area because it runs down slope to the Warnakee Reservoir Let's because we do that. not have the current, uh, they do not have currently uh, the remediation techniques, machinery, equipment, know-how to fix the water if that 1,4-dioxane gets to a detect level. Wow. So this is where we start to talk about a broader impact. I mean, you know, Chief, it's it's enough of a tragedy of what's happened to your people and the Lenape Nation in Ramapo. Now we're talking about this affecting also four to six million people in northern New Jersey. As we look at this map, can you describe to people what we're seeing in here and why the impact is so broad? So what we're seeing is the, uh, basically this is the watershed and inside of there is one of the most populous places in the state of New Jersey um, combined. And so where you see Greenwood Lake, there was actually a dump that had Ford, pay, Ford toxic paint sludge that was in there that they capped, right? So that cap is, has failed. There are trees growing through it. There, uh, that is, goes down the Wanakee Reservoir, goes into the Wanakee Reservoir. Uh, the site that our community is living in, the Ringwood Mine Superfund site, is the recharge area for the Wanakee Reservoir. Um, including in that water body there that feeds four to six million people every single second of every single day. When the water levels are low, they take and pump water from, the, from Pompton Lakes, which is a, which is, uh, a toxic mess and they pump that up to the Wanakee Reservoir, which means it gets a double dosing. So even if they're trying to say that you're not going to be affected by the Wanakee Reservoir, but what about the fact that you're pumping water from a, a known uh, Superfund site area and pumping that up there for people to, to send out? Right. And you can see that it goes all the way to Newark. And and I know you have said, you know, before Newark is now finding issues with lead, right? And their pipes in these toxin, toxins, don't they create a more of a leaching situation when they hit lead pipes? Yeah. So I'm just going to put this right out there as the truth. And for everybody that's going to be listening tonight, this is the truth. When we look north, and I don't mean to northern New Jersey, but north to Michigan, northwest. Yes. When we think about Flint, Michigan, and we think about how those lead pipes were in the ground for 100 years or more, and they did not leach lead. And the reason why those pipes leached the lead, because those somebody took and switched the water source that had chemicals from the automobile manufacturing plants. 
<laughs> right? That yeah. leached into those pipes that began a, a leaching process that was non, uh, you couldn't stop it, right? And so here, and that only happened over a short period of time. This has been going on for 57 years. So when when the mayor of Newark puts on national, you know, on the on the Channel 12 news that you know there's lead in the in the pipes and it's not coming from the, it's not coming from the pipes that was the original um, words, then it became oh it's the pipes are leaching you know the lead's coming out of the pipes. Well, the lead lead in the pipes does not come out on its own. It is because of other chemicals that are in there that is causing the lead to leach. And then when you have the state of New Jersey who issued that permit means that they're a responsible party, even though they're not being listed as one, they give the funding to Newark to change out all the lead service lines, right? And why? Because when you tell one lie or, or you violate people's trust, right, by knowing something and not doing anything about it and not letting them know, you are and should be held accountable to that. So let's be clear that uh, New Jersey and the town of Ringwood at some point were involved in issuing a permit to Ford to dump this highly toxic material. They actually gave them a permit to do it in the 70s. Is that correct? That is correct. And neither one of them really has been held accountable. The town is held accountable to a certain extent, right? But they work together with that corporation to minimize the loss of everything else. But they're not minimizing the risk to public health and safety or the environment. Now, the state of New Jersey has never, not ever, they have never been held accountable. They are not a PRP, a potential responsible party. They issued the permit. I have that permit. I gave them that. I showed it to them. And they still take no action. So even something as simple as a natural resource damage claim against Ford Motor Corporation, the ta- the state of New Jersey can't just go there and do it because Ford's going to turn around and say, hey, well, you gave us the permit. Right, right. So that means that they're compromised. Yeah. And being yeah. that they're compromised, they're compromised in every decision that they've been allowed to make where they should not have been allowed to do it. So, Judy, is it fair to say that these cleanup attempts that have been, um, you know, sort of start and stop and, and they've been partial and cap and monitor and just really not a complete solution, um, is it fair to say that's tied somewhat to the fear of liability? I mean, what is the answer there? I have seen the, the people from the Lenape Nation get on their knees in one video in front of the EPA and beg them to clean up their community. Why is, hasn't this been done? I think it's because the proper parties haven't been brought before the appropriate regulatory bodies, like Chief Man says. And also um, because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know about this. So there's no you know, community clamor about it. One thing I want to point out, and we're talking about Newark, Kearney, and there's many municipalities in Burton County actually get their drinking water directly from the reservoir. It's not like it just goes back into the watershed and regenerates. 60% of the water from the reservoir goes to Newark through pipes uh, because at one time the Passaic River was so contaminated that Newark couldn't produce its own water. So there are many, many towns in Burton County And then you look at the top towns that draw from this, you know, the environmental injustice situation just keeps to worsening. Um, 60% of that water goes to Newark. Um, So I think it's just a matter like anything else, you know, when, when you have the right parties before the right regulatory body and you have the correct community involvement and people know about it, then you will get better results. I was just on today. I was looking at the weekly circular that, uh, Pat Seppi, who's the community liaison at the EPA, sends out and says, here was what we did this week. And I clicked on the link so that people could get more information from the EPA. And the link's broken. I mean, it's just it's just sloppy inattention. Um, they don't care. They just don't care. Yeah, it's, it certainly feels that way. Uh, Chief, I have to ask you the obvious question. Why wasn't the Klan re- relocated? Um, all this dumping happened. Why didn't that actually occur? So before I answer that, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that the person in which you're talking about that was on her hands and on her knees begging, right? Yeah. That was my one of my clan mothers, Auntie Vivian, who is no longer with us anymore. 
I know. And I want to pause there and say, I know you guys lost her in August and um, she is an, it was absolutely a force of nature. And if people right. that need to read more and watch the documentary, you'll see Vivian and everything. And she did all that she could to save her people as you're doing. Um, it's heartbreaking to think that you lost her and really at a young age. I mean, she wasn't that old. It, it shouldn't have been added to the list of the horrific deaths that you've had to face. So why was the clan left there? Well, that's a, that's a good question, right? I would I would tend to say that the reason why uh, we haven't been relocated yet is simply because of politics and Pandora's box, right? They're more concerned about what somebody may think about annexing some land that is that was given to the state of New Jersey or the or Passaic County and allowing us to build a brand new, completely green, healthy community. Yeah. Not not just for us because we're all we're all dead. Right. Like the movie Walking Dead. That is us. Wow. Right? And it's going to take beyond seven generations to turn these DNA switches back off because our children are being born with these health ailments that they shouldn't be. And to connect that to Newark, who's to say, right, that in Newark, right, or in, you know, any of those other counties that are down there that get their water from the Wanaku Reservoir, that since 1964, right? That they have not been ingesting chemicals that they shouldn't have been ingesting. And so when there, when there is the, how do you say it? The um, willful withholding of information from the state of New Jersey, from the EPA to those residents downstream who are stakeholders too, they don't even know they're stakeholders because they don't tell them. And if six, if six million people had a voice and was able to sit there and say, you know what, we don't want you to leave that there. We bathe in that. Our pregnant mothers take that in. They feed the babies. They breastfeed them. The babies are born. They're washed in it. Your, your largest organ on your body is your skin. And then we want to sit there and put the blame on other things in their, in their local environment as to why these kids have these problems. Mm, absolutely. Why? I want to take that one step further, if I could, uh, Ms. Nader, um, yeah. when the um, when when Chief Man and I and some others uh, began to put additional pressure on the whole situation, there were professors from local universities who were giving presentations and opining about the dangers to the population. The, the borough of Ringwood did something very strange. They hired a public relations firm and not just any public relations firm, but like one of the top public relations firm in the state and did a blitzkrieg of, hey, everything's fine. Come here and look at our information. It was a very strange experience. I've never seen any entity that was under public scrutiny and a responsible party in the Superfund litigation go out and hire their own PR firm and are paying their lawyers and the PR firm, I believe, but I know for sure the lawyers out of their own damage claim that they got from the borough, from the uh, Ford people of $5 million as a chief man, $5 million and never told the clan. I just accidentally discovered it when I was doing some due diligence and pieced together a whole bunch of money. So they're paying their lawyers out of that fund. And then five seconds up the road, they're not doing any. And, and it really is not that expensive to re relocate them to over the ridge in a place called maybe Tranquility Ridge or something like that. It's really not that expensive. Right. R meanwhile, they stay there and they continue to really, really, like you said, the walking dead. Uh, in 2009, there was a lawsuit that was settled with Ford. And again, that is the subject of the documentary of Man versus Ford. I encourage everyone to watch it. Uh, Chief, it was a pretty disappointing settlement. It was a little bit of a slap in the face. I'll say a lot of it of a slap in the face of, of your people. Just describe quickly what happened there. Um, so basically, you know, the lawsuit originally it was supposed to be about just cleaning everything up, right? And giving us health benefits. That quickly was turned uh, by the lawyers to become this massive, you know, 700 and something person lawsuit. Um, the lawyers were going to take this to task. If this ever, any of this, right? The state of New Jersey, the town of Ford was to be put in front of a jury. They're done, all of them, right? And so the lawyers actually, before the settlement came about, the lawyers actually removed that. They petitioned a judge to remove themselves as our lawyers. 
And then they petitioned the judge to reinstate them as the lawyers because they believed that there was a settlement coming. Well, how would they know that if they were not representing the people? And they didn't even tell the people. They literally forced our people to sign those documents to receive a check or telling them, people who have nothing, right, that you're not going to get anything. So we have elders that were living there and born, like literally born in their houses who got $8,000. That money was not a settlement. That money was to make sure that the records of this case were sealed because there's that damning, right? right? Because this is a continuation of eugenics. It, it, it's such a yes, it's such a big thing that, you know, what played into it for Ford, let's just be honest, was the recession because they were uh, threatening bankruptcy in 2008 and 2009. And, you know, the people are looking at that saying, do we settle? And I was shocked at how little these people who have suffered and lost loved ones and the maladies are facing. You need to watch this, everyone, to see what your fellow human beings have been through. And for some of them to get a check for $1,000, what does that do? And then the next year Ford comes out of the recession and posts a uh, huge profit. So, so very, very disappointing. You know, I wanna, it, this shouldn't be a political issue, but sadly uh, it, it seems to become that. And so we've talked a little bit about the local level and your disappointments there. I wanna play a clip of, ironically, a video that just came out on November 23rd from the state of New Jersey, um, from the Environmental Protection Agency. And now that you've heard all this, everyone, watch this video, and I think you're going to find this to be um, a, a little bit hypocritical, and then we'll talk about, Chief, your letter to them. So, everyone, let's just watch a few minutes of this video. Sean Lotzer-Red, the state's Commissioner of Environmental Protection. You know, over the years, New Jersey has made tremendous progress in improving our air quality, improving our water quality and ensuring that our communities receive the environmental protection that they so deserve. But the truth is that despite the hard work of my colleagues at the Department of Environmental Protection, not every community has shared equally in the benefits of environmental protection. For far too long, our fellow residents in low-income and minority communities have suffered a disproportionate burden of the pollution that we all together create in the way we run our businesses and how we get to and from work, how we live our lives. Under Governor Phil Murphy's leadership, we have been committed to furthering the promise of environmental justice. New Jersey has passed the most empowering environmental justice law in the country, but there is still so much work to do. And at the Department of Environmental Protection, we are expanding our Office of Environmental Justice to do just that. We're going to work with communities to build capacity so that every environmental justice community understands how to engage with government and to stand up for their rights, to raise their voices and be heard. We're going to work internally to change the processes and procedures and protocols and rules that have had a disproportionate impact on our fellow residents. And we are going to work with fellow agencies throughout state government to help them change too. Because only together can we do the hard work of addressing the systemic injustices that have led to these disproportionate environmental impacts on low income and minority communities. So Chief, environmental justice, it is definitely the word of the day, the phrase of the day. When you watch that, how much does that frustrate you? And tell us about the letter that you sent as a result of that video. It is, frustration is not the word. Um, my family's dead. That person who represents the state of New Jersey is one of the people who might as well have been a part of the lynch mob. In that documentary video that they showed, they didn't even take the time to even involve us or include us, right? They're only talking about certain areas that receive the water from where the toxic place is, right? Didn't mention anything about us. They didn't come to our community to take video or, or, uh, or any of that. And so when I saw this, right, this was, man, I can't even tell you. It would be like watching somebody slap your mother, right, and not having the ability to do anything. 
And that's how we feel. We feel that we don't even have arms, right? We feel that we don't even have a mouth, right? Because these people, you know, they want to make all these claims. And then the reality of all of that, everything that they've said, right, is a lie. It is a lie. It's a flat out lie. There is no such thing as environmental justice in the state of New Jersey. And there definitely is not environmental justice for us. And so that prompted us to write a letter, right? Multiple letters, but we wrote them before, right? To the past attorney general, to the commissioner of the DEP. They came out, they made promises. They never returned the calls. They never responded to our letters. They didn't give us the time of day. That's the attorney general of the state of New Jersey. So that prompted us to do it again. I sent another letter to the attorney general and I sent the letter out to Michael Gordon and it was CC to Michael Regan and everybody else. And we have not received one response back from that in over a week. And we're not going to, right? We're not going to because they can't bring themselves to admit, right? Their wrongdoings. And I'm not a lawyer, but if you know something's wrong, and you do nothing about it, you're just as guilty as the people who did it, right? When you are hold, when you hold that position. So that means that all the past governors, right, from 1964 forward, right, all of the, the, the legislature of the state of New Jersey, all of them, they all need to be held accountable, right? And the only way that that can happen is in a court of law, not, with, not to allow the judge to state anything, but let people from the community who've been lied to and been mistreated and suffering without even having any of that knowledge. And, and, and again, Chief, you know, you're fighting for your people, but you're also fighting for millions in New Jersey who are unaware that they're drinking this water, that it's possibly changed their DNA, that maybe some of the autoimmune issues that they've had in their family are a result. They are in the dark. This isn't just about your community who clearly has suffered so much, but it's about a broader swath of people. It is a massive issue. So the state of New Jersey has failed. And, you know, the next question is what's going on at the federal le level. Judy, you know, I look at this map and I say, I look at, you know, CD5, which is the Congressional District uh, 5, which is Josh Gottheimer. He's been silent. He's done nothing. I look at the watershed map and I see New Jersey Congressional District 11, Mikey Sherrill, what has she done? And you go down to Newark, again, another, where are the Congress people who are representing our state and all these millions of people and supposedly standing up for environmental justice? What has been done on the federal level, level Judy? Absolutely nothing. Um, the only person that did help us at one time was Scott Garrett, um, who wrote a number of letters to the EPA. But since that time, um, Gothheimer has never showed up. Um, I see him at my high schools where I'm on the Board of Education talking about um, issues in the high school, but he hasn't come to the Superfund site 20 minutes away. I think we even invited him once, Chief Man, to a meeting, and then he canceled at the last minute under very questionable circumstances. I think it came to light that he used to work for Ford. So I'm not sure if that's the reason, but um, he never contacted us again. And I have not been contacted by any other congressman. Our local um, officials, our, you know, our state assemblymen do help us and our state senator has helped us. Right. But it's, it's such a big issue with the right. federal government being involved. We need big guns, you know, to be showing up at the EPA's offices and banging on the door and saying, this isn't right. You know, you have to change this. And they, they, they just don't respond. It's, it's just amazing. Let's be very clear that this site is in congressional district number five, Josh Gottheimer, where are you? Where are you? Because this is poisoning a large part of New Jersey. This is in your district. I, I cannot believe that nothing has happened. Now, we know that the recent infrastructure bill that was passed, H.R. 3684, and it was passed in November, uh, ironically, which is also National Native American Month, uh, Heritage Month, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Biden has been talking about this. There are funds that are earmarked, but funds have been earmarked. The Superfund has existed. So this isn't a matter of money, Chief. Do you have any belief that all of these great words have been said in this infrastructure bill and all these promises? Do you have any sense or any faith that that will come to fruition for you, for your clan, for the Ringwood area, and frankly, for half of New Jersey? 
So um, just to address, I just wanted to hit something really quick. You know, it's, it's ironic that that video uh, was put together and came out after we started putting even more pressure, right? But back in February, President Biden um, put out a mandate. Environmental justice is going to be at the forefront of everything. And, and not just new environmental justice communities, but the ones who have been in the back, who have been struggling all this time, right? And so now there is billions of dollars that are earmarked for communities such as ours. And the only way to make sure that that money flows to us, right, is that we have to, we have to figure out how that money is going to be funneled, right? And in the Native American world, even out West, in the, in the uh, NCAI, the National Congress of American Indian, you know, what is being done there is to try to push that legislation forward to say, we shouldn't be fighting each other over money to help save our people's lives. We need to be able to put in a form that says this is what we need to do and this is how much money it is. And that money needs to be sent to us directly, because when it goes to a state or a municipality or a county, those monies get put into the general fund or put and done fix a project for their neighbor. Right. Yeah. Or a family member. You'll never see it. Yeah. Right. So we're a part of the Justice 40 Accelerator, which is to prep us. Uh, I believe there's three or four Native American groups that were part of part of that Justice 40 Accelerator to prepare us in working with the federal government to ensure um, that if we're applying for grant money, that that grant money will come to us, that we can then turn around and take care of our community. Yeah. The, the only way that to make sure that any of this takes place is to do what we're doing right here which is why I'm so honored, you know, that you have chosen to listen to our story yeah. because it's not just a story of, of, of the turtle clan of the round of nation, right? It's 6 million people, you know, and, and we're the people who are, you know, have to find the time in the middle of, you know, a funeral to run out real quick and, and to go online to make sure that we do things to keep the, the awareness of this. Chief, I mean, this the story is immense. The story is so big that we could talk for another two hours and give detail. I mean, truly, you know, capturing this in a little bit of time is, is really difficult. It's immense. I encourage people to find out more. They need to, especially if they live in that watershed area or anyone they love lives there. And, and it is such a big story, Chief. And we're honored to bring you here. Judy, I have to ask you, um, what do we tell people? Because people are listening to this and they're saying, wow, I don't know what to do. This affects my water. Um, nobody's you know, doing what they should do. Let's give people some ideas on what steps they can take as concerned citizens. So I wrote down two phone numbers to try to give people some simple, you know, what can I do kind of uh, forward moving ideas. One is to the North Jersey Water Commission, which is the uh, regulatory body that takes care of the Wanakee Reservoir. That's 973-492-1393. That's 973-492-1393. And then the number for Region 2 of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is the federal government arm that's uh, overseeing the site, it's 1-877-251-4575. That's 877 251 Four five seven five. Um, I also suggest that they write to their local United States congressman. Absolutely, and also seek out more information. Watch. I can't say enough about the documentary because no one with a heart can watch that and say this is okay. Mm -hmm. But more, even even broader than that is the fact that this is a New Jersey emergency issue. Chief, what's next for your clan? Uh, well, hopefully not another funeral anytime soon. Um, you know, we are progressively moving forward. We're getting more aggressive um, with sending letters, making sure that the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And once we have all those things done and we get no response, right, that's still an action. Yeah. Right. And then when we get to uh, to bring this in front of whether it is the federal justice department, right, or a court. You know, um, they're not going to be able to say, well, you didn't go through the steps that you need to go through to get to where, you know, to here. We're already past all that. You know, Governor Corzine, Executive Order 122 mandates that every single every single department agency employee of the state of New Jersey has to speak to us. Yet they refuse to. Right. Where is the health department? Right. We had to we had to beg them to come to Ringwood. Not they would said they weren't going to come to a CAG meeting, but they would meet us at our church. What 
is that? That's a state agency, right? Yeah. And, and then one more thing I just wanted to throw out there, um, and feel free to answer this if, if you know. And it, it obviously coming from me is a little bit of a hint, but which is the which state in the United States or its U.S. territories has the highest level of autism? Oh, I know that right away. It's New Jersey and it's growing by the day. You're and right. we don't know why, but boy, don't you wonder, we have to look at our environment and we are a toxic state. And thank you for saying that, because once again, this is everyone who should care about this. I, I want to say to both of you um, that we thank you for being advocates. I know, Judy, you work very hard. I know, Chief, that this is your heart and your mission to protect your people. The level of injustice here is somewhat hard to take. Um, but our hope is that we are just starting to bring this issue to everyone and that we will continue to stand with you as well as you fight. And uh, we believe that, you know, over time, eventually the light gets bigger and people understand what's going on and they wake up. So I want to thank both of you so much for coming on. We will have you back, um, hopefully with some good updates. Uh, but we will share this show far and wide. And to everyone listening, please share this with everyone you can in New Jersey and ask them to take the time to listen. And not only that, Judy gave two phone numbers. You know, it matters when citizens call, when they call and they call and they call, they start to pay attention. We can't just leave this to chief and to his people to try to fix because it affects all of us who live in that area and all of us who have friends and family that live there. Thank you to both of you so Thank much you. for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. And to my audience, again, share this program and we will see you guys all next week. Have a